Hey. Hi. How you doing? Good. I haven't seen you in a while. I know it's been a minute. I like the hair. Thank you. It's, eh, it is what it is. <laughs> <laughs> I think it looks great. Like, um, so everyone who doesn't know, this is Prentice Penny. Uh, you are the executive producer and the showrunner for Insecure. <laughs> But your resume is long. This you you were in this this world before Insecure. Some of yes. my favorite shows: Girlfriends, Brooklyn Nine Nine, yeah. um, Uncorked, your first yeah. movie, yeah, which I love. I want to talk about that a little bit. I know that we have a hard stop, so I'm just gonna hop right in. That's what's up. Okay, so first of all, congratulations on finishing the new or the latest season Insecure. <laughs> Thank you, thank you, thank you. When you started Insecure, um, did you realize it was going to be so big? No. <laughs> I mean, I thought it was special when I read the the pilot that Issa and Larry wrote. Uh, and I just wanted to be a part of that. Uh, and I just thought I could help. And I just, I just thought the script was so good. And I felt like that's a voice that we need to hear. Um, and so however I can help, uh, that's what I was on board for. But I mean, I didn't expect this i just was like this is just a dope project and this is just seems like fun to do okay now i i asked you this before when i interviewed you a while ago but i don't think people are familiar can you kind of share how you met Issa ray and how you actually got the job yeah actually um you know again like small small circle so i'd read the script um and my one of my agents who's still my agent um went to college with Issa, and she was like um you should like maybe like you know, talk to her, write her a letter about why you think you'd be good. And I was like, yeah, absolutely. And so I wrote her a letter about why I thought she was good. And I had worked with Lena Waithe. Um, like Lena was an assistant on Girlfriends when I was like a young writer. And so we were friends. And so I hit Lena and was like, hey, can you just like put in a word for me too? And of course she did. And uh, I met Issa um, at a bookstore. She was doing a book signing for Awkward Black Girl. And we just talked and we realized like we're from the same neighborhood. Uh, we just we just got each other in a way like you know in terms of what we were trying to do comedically we just hit it off i really don't know to say except you're just like we just hit it off and uh at that point that was 2000 like february and march of 2015 and we've been rocking ever since so yeah okay cool looking back at this season what's one of your favorite moments Oof. Uh, I mean, there's so many. I mean, this season, we were always excited about this season from the moment Issa and I talked about this idea of opening this, letting the whole season be about Issa and Molly. And we really got excited when we said, oh, what if we start in where you're like, Issa said, I don't fuck with Molly. And then we have to figure out how we get there. Like, that was just an exciting mystery to be like, damn, what would make these two people who have been friends forever and not mess with each other no more? And right. so that just became really exciting to explore that, that idea, that question. And um, so I would say like, a lot of my moments are like the little slights and the little hurts that the characters go through. Like, I think the block party was one of my favorites just because you're watching it. You're like, okay, they come into the episode kind of like with a little bit of a rub, but when they're wobbling and you see Molly like bringing her the food and you see them dancing and you're like, oh, they're gonna like fix it. And you can see that they're good together, but then just to watch where it just goes left. And, and I think that's what we were trying to show. Like these friendships are, aren't every day like these are like special friendships you know and don't take them for granted and i think they kind of take it for granted one of the um the things that really stung when i was watching their going back and forth and like their different scenes together was when molly accidentally texted isa oh yeah that was real because yeah. it's like my biggest fear is to be talking yeah. about somebody and then yeah. text that person yeah yeah we talked about that in the room and it gave us it made us cringe in the room so it definitely was like, yeah, it was, and, and, and they're so good in that scene. Carrie Washington directed that episode and she did such a great job, but yeah, that, that in the room gave us chills. And so uh, it was good to see it play out that way too. But yeah, it's definitely a, a hard moment to watch for sure. Yeah. Um, people or viewers have really strong opinions about Issa and Molly's relationship. Did you realize that viewers were going to be so invested and have these strong reactions? I, to be honest, I was very, I think a lot of us were very surprised at how quick people turned on Molly. And what we realized, because the, the audience has never had to choose Issa or Molly. The audience has always been like, you're the team Lawrence or Daniel or Nathan or whatever guy, like you're a team guy, but you're mm -hmm. never like team, not the friendship because they haven't, I mean, they've had issues, but they've never been 
spin like this. Um, and so I think we thought, and the way we looked at it was like, they're kind of our 50-50 responsible for this. And I think what we probably underestimated was that because the show is always in Issa's point of view, that the audience might even subconsciously just take her side because um, Issa, I think the character has a tendency to laugh at herself. And I think Molly is much more guarded. And so it's, I think it's hard to empathize with somebody that sometimes feels very guarded. And I think in hindsight, we should have definitely made Issa like 60, 40 more Issa's fault because then at least that might buy the audience more empathy for Molly. Right. So, um, because when we looked in the room, we were like, Issa's not necessarily been the best friend. You know, Molly's always there. Like when, you know, when Molly got a run interference, the first season with Daniel and Lawrence are there and, and Molly's having her back to drive her back to go see Lawrence. And when, when Molly has, when Issa has the, Issa's, Issa's, we were like, Issa's always tricking Molly into a situation. She tricked her to go to Coachella. She tricked her to come to the wine. Now she tricked her to get into the lift in the season three premiere. She's always tricking Molly. Molly had her, like, when, when Issa's, like, losing her mind trying to find Nathan, she's, like, she's riding with her, like, helping her break into Andrew's apartment to find him. I mean, Molly's down. So this idea that, like, Molly doesn't get any goodwill to me was, like, a little bit, like, nah. But I think more people are Molly's than probably what they care to admit. But although you just broke down how Issa's, like, low-key manipulative, I really didn't see that as a viewer until... You said it or until like Issa Rae has been in interviews and she's talked about it. And she's been tweeting like, hey, guys, let's also kind of yeah. do her care. You know, I, I never looked at it like that. And I, yeah. I think a lot of viewers yeah. didn't as well. And I think because a lot of times I think people forget that there's a there's a pattern, there's a history. Right. And so when you're watching a season and this might have been just wrong for us, too, like. You're just into that season. You're not necessarily thinking like, oh, yeah, that's right. But when we're writing, we have to write from a place of like, well, what have we shown? We have to write. We have to have receipts for like the things we write. So we had to like say, OK, well, how, what are the mistakes that and we made lists of what were the Molly mistakes and what are the Issa mistakes? And so we because we, that's what we have to write from, because otherwise you're just kind of making things up as you go. So right. um, but I don't think the audience is always looking at it like, oh, yeah, that's right. Like Molly, you know, um, but we were hoping they would. But obviously, no, they we, definitely don't. <laughs> we don't. We don't. We're, we're right here. We're just yeah. right here. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what do you think the biggest misconception is about Insecure? I think the biggest in the misconception is that I think people think that we like go on Twitter and then like you tweet something one week and then you see it the next week and you go, see, they did it. I'm like, this show has been made. <laughs> like we started writing this, this season back last April and May. So like we were writing from like April to uh, like August. So the writing was done. So this idea that people go like, oh, they took my advice. So they I look at them, they turn to things or it's like, no, this has been done for like, months we're just like you're just you know what i mean so i think this idea that it's happening in real time right is always funny because it takes so much time to make a television show but, but we um, don't but we, the thing is we don't know that because no, of course of we're course, regular course, people like oh they, 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 they just they shot this last week you know yeah exactly it always feels like they like oh they i tweeted it and then they shot it last week they filmed it edited it, wrote it did everything and it came back out on the sun on the next week and it's like nah, it doesn't i have to like that Right, gotcha. Well, I mean, I know, but I'm just saying, like, as a regular, you know, like, as a... Of course, uh, uh, to uh, no, totally. If you're not in this world, I would totally get why you would feel that way. But that, I feel like, is the biggest misconception of things. I have to ask for people, like, no, 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 no. This was, like, something Six we came up with last year. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so you all were renewed for fifth season, which is major. Yes, we're super excited. Um, the show's based in L.A. Do you think that you all will kind of touch on anything that's going on now, like Corona or social justice or anything like that? Or Yeah, I think we'll do it in our way. You know what I mean? I think that, like, we've never tried to, like, whether, say, Obama or Trump or... It's like we all know the world we're living in. So we've always tried to say, like, in this world or in this climate. So we're definitely not writing this show in a world where, like, Corona doesn't exist, but we're also not necessarily making... Corona heavy storylines, or um, I show our show has always dealt with race. So dealing with what's happening in the world is just something we're going to continue to discuss, but not in a way that's like where the show becomes the platform for that thing. But we still talk about the thing, right? You're not a law and order us. No, we're not going. <laughs> law. We're not going law and order nobody. No. Um, would you ever consider working on an insecure spinoff? uh sure maybe if it was if it was right i mean i think Issa and i like 
that I guess it would be like, who who is that? Who who do, who do people want to see in the Insecure spinoff? Who is what what character? Yeah, I don't know. I think it always sounds good, and then when you go like, well, who do I want to watch for like five more years? Like I and I'm not saying they're not they're not interesting. I think they're all super um, interesting. I just don't know. It'd be, I guess it'd be figuring like what stories would you be telling? To me, right. you almost want to go like so far left that like in the way that they kind of did with Frasier, where you don't maybe take the main, you kind of take like an auxiliary character and like follow yeah. that person because you could build that life out. Like I feel like you wouldn't want to do Molly because you've already seen enough of Molly's life. Right. Like to me it would be like if you did Kelly or somebody like that, where you'd go like, oh, what is that life like? You know what I mean? Uh, to be in her shoes or somebody else's shoes who you don't really know. But I think any of the main people, I think you feel like you kind of know them already. Yeah, been there, done that. Um, I think yeah. last, last week, I think Trump, did he like a tweet about Insecure or did he? Yeah, I don't know what that, I don't know what, I don't know if that was just a, like, I'm pissing black people off. I need to just like something they like real quick. But he also picked like the color purple, like little slavey stuff. So I was, it, like, it was on brand. Yeah, it was on brand. Yeah, it was on brand. So I didn't really know what to make of any of that. I just was confused. Like, I don't know what, but just keep, I felt like just keep our name out your mouth. Don't bring us in your mess right now. Don't try to use us as like some, yeah, yeah, see, I'm down. So, you know, MAGA loves the black folks. MAGA loves insecure. Like, I was like, I don't want no MAGA loves nothing with this. So, no, nah, I was confused. Yeah, we all were. Um, I'm going to ask you some questions about the finale, but I said, I yeah. told everyone on Instagram, I told everyone on our live that I would warn you guys before I ask him about the finale. So if you want to. Oh, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So, um, uh, first of all, your cameo was hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, is that... the writer is always usually in the episode they write. So there wasn't a lot of, things I could do. At first, he used to want to be the bus, be the bus driver. And I was like, I'm not, I was like, I'm not going to be the bus driver. That's a lot of talking. Huh? That's a lot of talking. It's a, well, it's a lot of talking. And I was like, that's not what I do. Mm -hmm. Two, it was going to be so hard to film. That was such a, like, that bus sequence took uh, four nights for me to direct, four and a half. And so the thought of me having to direct that and no lines, I was just like, that's just too, that's just too much. So there really wasn't anything else I could do besides be the uh, security guard. So I just leaned into my Otisness. I just leaned into being Otis. I loved it. I loved it. Um, uh, how did how? Because you wrote and directed last night's episode, the mm -hmm. finale. Yeah. How did you um come up with the the pregnancy? That whole storyline. How did you? Where did that come from? So it it came from an idea of us one saying like, how does life? You know, we had made Lawrence very successful. Like, we had really taken Lawrence from, like, season one, you know, where you're like, he's on the couch, he's working at Best Buy to, like, where he is now. And it kind of felt like, well, we need to, like, how do you continue to make this character more complex or give him a little things that are dirty or just make that character a little bit more flawed or have a little bit more, like, he's not perfect either. And, um, you know, what are the things that he might have found himself in? And so we, we were trying to figure out things that felt that way. And we just kind of like that idea um, of, well, what if that is? And that's true of a lot of people his age. That, yeah. Like, I mean, that's like, it almost felt in some way like uh, everybody has a scare or like a real thing, you know? And what is it like when you, because we also like this idea of like, just when you think your life is like, you got, finally got it's like, there's always some part of it that's like never quite clicking or it's clicking. And then this thing happens and we really want to see like, what do these characters do? can they stay true to what they said is, you know, for season five? Because we don't write these things also in a vacuum. We understand that, like, we kind of thought we were going to get a season five. And so we wanted to lean into the idea of, like, oh, if we wanted to carry that into season five, how would, how might that look? How might that be challenging for Issa and them to be saying, like, oh, you make me happy, but here's this scenario. And, like, life doesn't always come in the way that uh, you want. And so how do you how do you wrestle with it when it doesn't? And so we like that for, for Lawrence and Issa. How did the cast react when they found that out? What was their reaction uh, like the writer, right in the writer's room? Or uh, they they, uh, I'm trying to think when they found out. I mean, uh, I think Christina was like, wow. Uh, and Jay, I think Jay was like, wow, wow too. Uh, but we kind of do a thing at the beginning where we sort of talk through, even though we didn't have this figured out, we usually talk through the actors before the season and say, hey, this is kind of what we're thinking for the characters. And then they voice their opinions and they give ideas 
um, as well. And we incorporate those into the thing too. But I think it was definitely like, you know, I definitely think Jay was 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 happy uh, coming into the season. And I think when the baby thing hit, uh, but it was a little crazy because he was having a baby in real life. So in a lot of ways, it, it was kind of like a weird mirroring thing like that. And so, right. um, so yeah, it would just became kind of a, a art imitating life. Okay. Um, I think that's all my insecure questions. Um, I want to talk about Encore. Sure. Great movie. Loved it. I'm kind of familiar with your work, so I wasn't surprised, surprised it kind of surrounded like wine and stuff like that. Um, but I think I read that, she's the, that some parts of it were loosely based off your real life. Is that true? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, the, the, the dynamic between the father and the son was really based on me and my father. Okay. Like, I always felt like you never really see Black men having sort of, like, Black father-son stories where you don't have, like, it's always like the, the like, usually in, in, a, in a white studio movie, usually it's like the father wasn't around. That's why they have a problem. Right. And I feel like white movies, they could just have an issue just because they just have an issue as human beings. Like movies like Lady Bird or Manchester by the Sea or Good Will Hunting, they just get to kind of tell these slice of life stories. And I feel like we don't get to tell those stories for, for, for us and specifically for black men. And so I wanted to talk about that and address that, that like we and my father, we just had issues as two men, not as like he was not absent because my father was around. So mm -hmm. um, it was just, we just had issues as people. And so I wanted to just to show that I think like the more you show our humanity, the less you we get to see our pain and our burden and we see more of our beauty right and so to me that was sort of the 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 logic behind it was this a story that you always had been sitting on or did you write it recently i wrote it in 2000 i started writing in 2014 okay uh but i knew that once i had it was really once i had boys it made me understand my father differently so i didn't i don't know if i ever intended that to do that but once i had children specifically boys it made me appreciate and understand my father as just a guy who was trying to figure out his life and less like my father as more just like yeah he was like 24 trying to raise a son and run a business and he didn't always make the best choices and sometimes he made great choices you know um but i understood that feeling now and i understood why me going and following in our family's lineage was more important to him th than when I was a child. Because when you're a kid, you're just like, I want to do what I want to do. You know what I mean? I don't want to do this. Or you reject it because you're like, it's more symbolic of what I'm rejecting, right? And I think a lot of that my father felt maybe I'm rejecting him and his love as opposed to like, I just don't want to do that. And I didn't really appreciate either on my side that like what that meant to him, you know, because I wasn't a father yet. So I, why would I know what that felt like? And once I became a father, I just understood now because I had been a child and I had been a parent and I could understand the full picture. And I was like, oh, I want to explore that with like black men because I don't ever see that. Okay, gotcha. Um, switching gears a little bit. I want to yes. talk about, you've been very vocal on social media about social injustice. Um, and then one of my favorite tweets, um, do you know what I'm about to say? No, I don't know. Okay. One of my favorite tweets, you tweeted something along the lines of if you're white and you work with me in the past and you don't stand oh, up, lose yeah. my number. Yeah. Yeah. Um I, I feel like you said that with your whole chest. Oh, all my chest. <laughs> all did any chest. of your white colleagues or people that you like work with before, did any of them start speaking up after that or yeah, and to like to be honest, uh yeah. And and I had to and, and giving them like credit for reaching out to me. Um, two had reached out before I even tweeted that, um, and one reached out after, but I'm not as associating that with the thing. I'm just going to believe that they just did. And we've been having conversations and they've asked me, you know, they've been, you know, uh, ad admitting they should have done some things differently. Asked me, how can they be, how can they help not just in the world, but also like help in the specific field they work in. Right. And so we I've been having conversation with them about what it was like when I was the only black writer in the room and what that felt like. And the, and the, and and what it feels like for other time, other writers of color. And obviously, I'm just speaking specifically black when you're the only one in the room. Right. And so um, and giving them things they can do to move forward and just think differently. And I think like but there are some showrunners who just don't care, you know, so I was glad that, you know, three of the ones I had worked with had reached out and we're having we're having more conversations about it so I, I appreciate them for doing that okay um you've been very vocal on social media also about how white your industry is yes. um and i feel like you've already touched on this but what are you what are you kind of doing to change that i mean i think one of the things obviously from a, a, just a, an immediate standpoint that i that i'm trying to do is obviously in the art that I'm trying to create, right? So that's the that's the first thing, right? So I look at it as like it kind of 
filters down, right? So if the art I'm trying to do is like in this area, right? Then like the artists that have to support that have to also be in this field, right? And so I think the beauty of that is like on our show specifically um, is we have, a, I mean, most of our writing staff is all black <laughs> with the exception of like two writers uh, and, bl and heavy black women obviously as well and giving more black directors opportunities more, you know, in our, in our show we have like 50% of like every department at a minimum has to be black and people of color, like at a minimum. So right. like, so like already that in depart and in the department heads too, because the department heads are where the hiring happens. Right. And so it's not enough to just say, Oh, you, you got like three black people in this department. It's like, no, the department heads then decide who comes in. Right. And I mean, that's a location transportation. There's so many departments in a, in a TV show and a movie that you're just like that have been typically like those the like the grips and the electrics and the camera people that it can stay so white and so like well we looked and we couldn't find it's like that's bullshit you know what i mean and so uh so we so but that filters down right and so then what you inevitably happen is you end up happening having a crew of like if your crew's 300 people that you have 200 that are black and people of color which is like i've been on shows where there's been and they always exist in like hair and makeup, but that's not like pushing new ground, right? right. Making new opportunities. Uh, it's just kind of reinforcing what's there anyway. And so not that you don't need that, but it's like, there's more. And so what that filters down into is that anytime they can put something, a show like ours on their resume, it just gives you more credo than this. And like, oh yeah, sure. You worked on like this black independent thing. While dope doesn't translate to like a thing that other white people that are hiring go like oh and like respected and i think that's the things we're trying to do is open that for writers and directors and and people in all departments down the line but that's all through like myself or isa or kenya taking a pen to a page or a typewriter or a typewriter nobody just typewriters <laughs> computer uh and creating like creating and obviously there's stuff we can do outside of that but that's just obviously again how just creating something of art in one tiny with one person filters down into 200 kinds of jobs and 200 kinds of opportunities thank you so much i want to i want to i want to do this again because i want to talk about i want to talk about um what is it cowboy what is it Compton cowboys i want to talk about that so i want to talk about this stuff so i want to do this again so thank Absolutely. you for, thank you for always supporting us and responding to our DMs and our everything. I really appreciate Absolutely. it. Absolutely. And when we're filming this shit, you guys have to come down and like while we're filming. Yep, we're down for that. So thank you so much, Prentice. I'll check in with you in a few months. Absolutely. Sounds good. Take care, guys. Uh, okay, bye-bye.